Let me invite you to stand with us as we sing of the joy that we have with the Lord. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of the night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. When the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When I cannot see you with my eyes, let faith arise to you. When I cannot feel your hand in mine, let faith arise to you. God of mercy and love, I will praise you, Lord. When you shine with glory, Lord of light, I feel alive with you. In your presence now I come alive, I am alive with you. There is strength when I stay, I will praise you, Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. Father, we gather this morning to be challenged and instructed by your word, to have fellowship with one another, and to sing praises to you. May all that we do in this hour bring honor and glory to your name, and may it carry us through the opportunities and the challenges we face in the days and weeks ahead. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated for a moment. We have a couple of events coming up. February 10th is our Sweetheart Banquet. If you've not yet signed up, we encourage you to do that out in the foyer. It's a great event. It's on Saturday night, February 10th from 6 to 8. Pastor Elijah Belts will be here from Tabernacle Baptist Church to share the Word of God with us. And it'll be a great opportunity of fellowship, and we're looking forward to that. Also, through the month of February, we are collecting change through baby bottles. Those baby bottles are out there in the foyer. That is for the Finger Lakes Pregnancy Care Centers of Ithaca and Cortland. We encourage you to take a baby bottle, take your change you have at home, fill it up. You can also put cash in it. You can also write a check in it to um, Finger Lakes Pregnancy Care and return that by the end of February, and we'll be giving that as a gift to them. Also on the end of February, on the 25th, Pastor Early will be here from Renovation House. I spoke at our annual meeting last week. We uh, preliminarily approved the idea of using money in our missions account to help them build a pottery um, studio 
as part of their ministry of working in uh, the, reno- the lives of people who come as part of their ministry, as well as making money for the ministry. I talked to Judah Baker, who's one of their leaders this week. They, have, they are working on a bid from a company to provide a kiln and all the other things involved in that. And he's going to get that information to me this coming week and was excited about the opportunity of expanding their ministry. Um, we also elected officers last week, approved the new budget, and are working on a couple of projects. Um, the driveway in the back that we got the retaining wall built this last year, we're looking at what that will cost to pave that this coming year. We're also looking at carpeting for the foyer, and we're going to review that at our quarterly meeting that will come in a couple of months um, about what the cost. We have a bid on what the cost of that project is, and we'll keep you informed on that. Our call to worship this morning. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples, for his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's continue to sing. Stand with us as we sing, My Faith is Found, a Resting Place. Scripture reading comes from 1 Kings chapter 10. The first six verses is dealing with the wisdom of Solomon as represented by the Queen of Sheba coming. Now when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with camels that bore, bore spices, very much gold and precious stones. When she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. 
Then she said to the king, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. The thing that drew the Queen of Sheba to Solomon was the name of the Lord. Let's sing of the name of the Lord. I cast my mind to Calvary, which is the that as we look at your word, we'd be open to your spirit leading us where we need to go. 
We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. you Maybe see to we'll invite the kids to come on up here as we talk about smart people. What should the smartest person in the world know? What should the par smartest person in the world know? Give me one thing you think they should know. That's not specific enough. What do you think they should know? They should know not to jump out of an airplane with a backpack. Okay. That's... Okay. Any facts they should know, smartest person in the world? Not to sin. That's a good one. That's a good one. Should they know the outcome of the football games before they're played? No. Should they be able to figure it out? Oh, that doesn't matter that much compared to sin. What else should they know? Papers made out of trees. Let me ask you this. What should the smartest person in the world do with their intelligence? Do you suppose they should build a rocket to Mars? Yeah. Yeah. You suppose they should grow a fruit that keeps you from ever getting hungry? Yeah. That'd be pretty cool. Do you suppose they should work on curing all diseases? Yeah. Okay. Now, have you heard of people who get doctor's degrees? I'm not talking medical doctors, just people who get doctor's degrees. You know, there's medical doctors, there's legal doctors, there's doctors of sociology, there's doctors of math, there's doctors of biology, all sorts of doctors. How smart is a person with a doctor's degree? On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being they're not very smart at all, 10 being they're the smartest person in the world, person with a doctor's degree, what kind of, what do you think they are? A 5? Okay. What do you think? And they think they're higher than a 5 on the smart scale person who's got a... A doctor's degree? Think they're smarter than a five? A nine, maybe? Do you know what's interesting? Go on, what do you think? A seven? I met a guy who had a doctor's degree. I met a lot of people with a doctor's degree, but this guy had a doctor's degree in grass. He had a doctor's degree in grass. He ran a department at Cornell University, and they studied grass. Now, do you think grass is important? Yeah. Is there different kinds of grass? Yeah. One of the things I was talking to him one time, this was about 10 years ago, I was talking to him, he says, what are you working on right now? He says, we are working on turf that goes on sports fields. And we're trying to determine the best, best mix of grasses and develop the best grasses for sports fields so it wears well and survives in the particular climate in which we're going to put that. Do you suppose a sports field in South Carolina is different from one in Montana? Yes. Yeah. And so that's what he's working on. Sometimes the smartest people are only smart, though, in a really small little subject area and not in everything. In what area do you think you, I don't want you to answer me. I just want you to think about this. In what area do you think you are the smartest that you might ever be? or an area that you would like to become the smartest in something you're interested in. Just think about that. Solomon, how smart was Solomon? Here's what Solomon studied. The entire world, the universe. He also studied what made people happy. He also studied about law and justice. And then he studied about what is the point of working and what is the purpose for life. Solomon studied everything. And one day he was approached with a problem that I'm going to describe later in the whole message. There were two women who came to him who claimed one baby belonged to both of them. They each had a baby. One of the babies died. And the two women claimed that the surviving baby was theirs. They'd had their babies three days apart. They were both sons. And they come to Solomon saying, that baby's mine. And the other woman says, that baby's mine. And they came to Solomon and said, Solomon, you've got to figure out whose baby it is. This is before there's DNA. You can't check blood type. They couldn't do any of that. 
how would he determine which lady was telling the truth and which lady was telling a lie? I'm not going to tell you now about it. I'll tell you about it in the message. If you guys are going to Children's Church, you can go. If you want an outline, they're up here. The question we're going to begin to explore today and in some messages to follow is, what is wisdom? What is wisdom? I wrote my own definition of wisdom a couple of weeks ago. A considered application of truth. And what do I mean by that? A considered application of truth. First, there is truth. And truth doesn't change. Truth is truth. You start there. And you want truth to do something. You want to be able to apply truth to your life. If this is true, therefore, this is what I do. But before you get to the application, you might want to take enough time to think about it. That's why it's called considered. A considered application of truth. One of the things we find in Solomon's life is he examined the world for truth, and then he considered what it would mean for the people for whom he was responsible as their king. Wisdom answers what is right, that is truth. Wisdom directs what should be done with that truth. So from where does wisdom arise? Wisdom starts with an honest observation of life. Too often we do not take the time to examine life as it presents itself around us. We don't take the time to understand people. I was, I was with a I was with some students this last week in the middle school. And one of the students I know pretty well, we've had, a, we've had some opportunities together. But this last week, one of the things I discovered in this student's life in an offhand remark he made was that he does not live with his parents. He lives with an aunt. I don't know where his parents are. I don't know anything about his parents. I don't know whether he has brothers and sisters. I don't know any of the background. I've only met this, 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 this young man only in the setting of some, some eighth grade classes. At, at, but in an offhand remark, he was talking to one of the other students in the classroom, and he says, he mentioned the fact that he lives with his aunt. That's a truth. That's an observation. Will that have an impact in a person's life? It might. It certainly has some impact, the person to whom you live with. Solomon was desirous to observe life. Wisdom sees the appropriate desired end. So no matter what subject you look at, wisdom sees the end that we would like to accomplish. How will I apply, apply the truth that I discover? What do I want it to look like when I get to the end? And then wisdom understands the path that connects the two. So wisdom sees the truth, and wisdom sees the end, and then wisdom tells us how to get there. The Bible gives us a description of what a husband and wife relationship is. It gives us the truth. It gives us the end. But the Bible also gives us the path to get there. Here's how you arrive at the truth of what a marriage could look like, or a family could look like, or a relationship with your neighbor, or your perception of what I should do when I'm at work. The Bible gives us the truth. And the Bible gives us the path. And much of what Solomon does in his writings, in his speaking, is to provide that path, that observation of truth, that desired end, and the path to get there. Wisdom tells us where we are and can shed light on where we want to go and how to get there. What did Solomon want for his people? First Kings chapter 3, verse 9. Solomon is asked by God, what do you want? And he says, therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this great people of yours. Solomon asks for wisdom. He wants an understanding heart. He says basically to God, let me walk in the steps of my people. Help me to understand. Now, Solomon was raised in a king's household goes from being raised in a king's household to being a king, goes to live in a world in which there are servants who care for his needs, 
There are people surrounding him who want the best for him and want to help him achieve those things. And so he doesn't walk necessarily in the steps of a person who lives in Galilee, a person who lives over on the Jordan River, a person who lives near the Mediterranean coast, a person who lives close to a Philistine encampment where there's always the possibility of danger. Solomon doesn't walk in their shoes. And what he says is, God, help me to understand the people to whom I serve and how they live their lives. One of the reasons the American process to becoming president requires primaries is so that candidates are forced to literally walk in the shoes or at least in the locations of the people who will vote for them. They have to spend time in Iowa and New Hampshire and South Carolina and Maine and New York. And a candidate, if he's going to be president or she is going to be president of the United States, they want to see if the person, the man or woman, can stand up to months of dreary walking in the footsteps of the people who will vote for them. Solomon wants that kind of a heart. He wants the judgment gene. Notice what he says. I want to be able to discern he wants to make good decisions. Help me to see things as they are and discern between good and evil. He wants to recognize good from evil. Let me see the black and let me see the white. First Kings chapter 3, verse 12. God responds, Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. These are the words of God. Do you suppose God knows the people who have lived before Solomon? Do you suppose he has an understanding of the people who've lived? Do you think God has a foresight of who will come after him? And here's what he says. Nobody is going to rise above you. You have Olympic champion wisdom. If they have a competition for wisdom, you're going to come out on top. If we could raise from the dead everyone who's lived before you, and we could bring forward or bring back to you everyone who will live after you, and we have a competition on wisdom, if it's a massive jeopardy tournament on wisdom, guess what? You're going to be the grand champion. You're going to win. You are going to be the best there ever was. So when we read the words of Solomon in the Bible, if we truly believe that God exists, if we truly believe that God gave us this word, if we truly believe that what God tells us in the word is true and an accurate rendering, he is telling us that when you read the words of Solomon, you are not going to find better wisdom. You will find other people who might say those same wise things with other words. They might apply them to situations that Solomon didn't know existed. But the kernel of truth that you're going to find in the words of Solomon is going to be the starting point of every decision that requires wisdom. Wisdom to understand, wisdom to judge, wisdom to see right from wrong. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 16. Now two women who were harlots came to the king and stood before him. Solomon is going to use God's gift of wisdom. This is not just something for him to contemplate, to write some book that nobody will ever read. There are a lot of books that nobody ever reads. There are academic books that people write on, on amazing subjects, and 300 are are purchased and they're put in 300 libraries and nobody ever reads them but the words that solomon has are going to be used to help people so two prostitutes come to solomon two prostitutes give birth to two babies three days apart one of the babies dies the babies sleep with their mother one of the mothers rolls over smothers her child and the baby dies that's the scenario one of the mothers then accuses the other of switching babies, a live one for the dead one. So the woman who smothered her baby goes and takes the baby from the other woman and switches them. So now her baby's alive, and that woman's baby has perished. How could Solomon decide in a she said, she said argument? So the woman says, it's my baby. The other one says, it's my baby. And how is Solomon to determine this great quandary? Does Solomon understand jealousy? Do you think he understands the concept of jealousy? 
that two people could be living in one house and two people could have different circumstances and one wants the other circumstances for their own? Do you think Solomon understands grief? That the loss of a child, regardless of the nature of the woman and the, and the means by which she got pregnant and had a child, regardless of that, does Solomon understand grief? Does Solomon understand a mother's love? Now here's where you get off. He's a man. How could he possibly understand what a woman is thinking, what a woman is feeling? Well, God is going to give to Solomon wisdom that nobody else has. And Solomon's going to have insight into people, into their character, into their desires, and into their deepest feelings. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 24. Then the king said, here's the solution, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword before the king. Solomon offers to divide the child. You'll get half and you get half. Is Solomon serious? Of course not. He's making a point. He's making a point with a sword to these two women. If you're both telling me the truth, then you both deserve to have the child. And the only way the both of you can have the child is we actually literally divide the child. So what I'm saying to you is I know one of you is lying. One of you is not telling the truth. This child can only belong to one of you. And do you want me to believe both of you? Who's going to be the bigger person? Who's going to tell me the truth? And how am I going to be certain what you tell me is the truth? Because somebody's lying. See, if one can't have the child, then no one gets the child. That's the solution. If one of you can't have the child, then no one gets this child. What does Solomon know? 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 26. Then the woman whose son was living spoke to the king, for she yearned with compassion for her son, and she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and by no means kill him. But the other said, Let him neither be mine nor yours, but divide him. That quickly, in this illustration, Solomon wisely sets these women up for the truth of their character. The one has compassion, will never want her child to die. Obviously, she hasn't had her own child already die. And the other, who's already had her child die, would just as soon every mother lost every child. Because why should someone have the joy of raising a child when mine has been taken from me? That quick, now I don't know about you, because we know this story, so many of us know this story, we could say, oh, if I was in that situation, I would do this. That's because we know this story. If you did not know this story and this came before you, I mean, what would your solution be? Well, in the, today's technology world, you would take a blood sample, you would take a DNA test, you would, you would figure it out, right? You would check, I, I mean, when they're infants, they don't look like their mother necessarily. Uh, and so you would, you would take some kind of scientific method. But Solomon understands people. Solomon understands the nature of people, the nature of sin, the nature of righteousness, the nature of compassion. The real mother will not let her son die. 1 Kings 3.27, so the king answered and said, give the first woman the living child and by no means kill him. She is his mother. Now does Solomon limit his exercise of wise judgment to those who come to him? So here's Solomon, God is giving him all this wisdom and he's just waiting for people to come so he can solve their problems and share what he's been taught. First Kings chapter four, verse 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largest of heart like the sand of the sea. What will Solomon do with this abundance of wisdom? I just got, I have so much I have to say. One of the things I was taught when I was in school and then later reinforced by Howard Hendricks. Howard Hendricks was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary who taught people how to teach the Bible. That was, his, that was his role, master teacher. And one of the things he taught was never go into a lesson without an overflow of information. You should teach out of the overflow of your study. There should be more that you have learned on your own that you can possibly put into a lesson of 15 minutes or an hour so that you're teaching the best parts that's flowing out. Fill yourself up with an overflowing. What I have found 
later now in my ministry in the last year or two particularly is no matter where I am studying in the Bible, they're all connecting, so it all becomes this big overflowing thing. And here's the problem, and maybe some of you have noticed it, particularly if you're here maybe on a Wednesday night or a Sunday night, is I keep giving you previews of other things I'm teaching in other settings because it's all blended, and I can't help it anymore. And I was telling the Sunday school class this morning, even the things I listen to, podcasts and things that just come up randomly, randomly on my Facebook feed, they seem to connect to the very things I'm studying. So I'm studying about the otherworldliness from the ascension of Christ, where Christ goes into the other world, not this world. And then I hear two different podcasts that talk about there's only two places to worship. Worship God or worship Satan. And this Jewish pastor... He was a Jew who's now converted to Christianity as a pastor, was making the argument on the Ben Shapiro show that every false god is from Satan. Only the true God of the Bible is the true God, and everything else is a deception and lie. Everything else. And I heard that random thing about uh, four or five days ago, and then it began to click. All these other things I'm studying, I never totally considered the black and white of it. What does Solomon ask for? Give me the black and white. And here all of a sudden, I hear this black and white. And then I hear this other podcast, this other thing that dealt with UFOs. And if you want the story, you can ask the people in Sunday school. UFOs, that was just another illustration of man looking for a false god. See, they revealed the Pentagon Papers, and now we know that aliens are real. Really? No, we know that Satan has been deceiving people for six decades with the idea of aliens and UFOs and all of that. That's what we know. But the truth is still the same as Solomon understood it. There is the worship of God and the worship of false gods. And God is the God of the Bible and God is the God of the universe and the God of creation. And then Satan is the deceiver of everything else. And you can trace through all of the other deceptions and find in it the counterfeiting work of Satan to lead us astray from following God. So what does Solomon do with this abundance of wisdom? He shares God's gift of wisdom. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 30, how does he share it? Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. Solomon's wisdom, in the words of the writer here, says there was no one who lived in the east, no man who could rival what Solomon knew. There have been men who have come up in history, great thinkers, people who thought outside of the box, who have made great discoveries, have made great postulates. They have, they have, they have envisioned things they thought they knew and have gone out to, to discover those. There have been men like Einstein, like Tesla. There have been great men like Newton, like Galileo who thought that the world was bigger or different than we've always considered. In the day of Solomon, there were men like that, men who were examining the world, men who thought they knew better than anyone else, and God says Solomon excelled all of them, including all of the collected wisdom of what was probably the most intelligent ancient culture, Egypt. There were things that Egypt was doing 4,500 years ago that nobody in today's world could imagine they could do. They were doing stuff in medicine. They were doing stuff in architecture. They were doing stuff in engineering and in math that nobody can understand because they didn't have a written language. They had hieroglyphics. They had a symbolic language. And that symbolic language doesn't give you the nuances of what they knew. But as they examine the stuff of Egypt, they go, there was no nation with its collected wisdom that could match Solomon in his individual wisdom. Now think about that. I mentioned to the kids, PhDs. PhD means you're an expert in a tiny little area, a tiny little segment of a study. A guy who, a man or woman who pursues a PhD is not looking, yes, they'll have a broad education in the subject, that'll be their college, then look at their master's degree, which will narrow it down a bit, but then their PhD will get down to a single idea that their supervisor, their director, wants them to study. I remember Chris Davis. Chris Davis was my coach at Baptist Bible College. He was about 27 years old when I arrived, and he was the cross-country coach, and he was the track coach, he was the wrestling coach. 
and he was a graduate of Biola University, and he'd been a national champion at Biola University in wrestling and in track. And I met him. And about five years into, eh, it was probably five years into it, he decided he was going to go get his PhD in physical education at Ohio State University. Ohio State University would accept six candidates a year. He got in from Baptist Bible College. He got into that PhD program. And he spent that year, and when you graduate from Ohio State University with a PhD in physical education, you can have any job in the country. The first job that was offered to him was athletic director at Arizona State University. And you know what Chris Davis did? He came back to Baptist Bible College and spent 40-some years at Baptist Bible College. I asked him one day, what is going to be your study for your PhD? What is going to be your final project? And here's what his final project was. The redevelopment of volleyball for fifth and sixth graders to teach them the game when they're not able to play it. Fifth and sixth graders are not able to play volleyball. They have no ability to hit the ball the way it needs to be hit. And their project was to develop a new technique to begin teaching the fundamentals of volleyball to fifth and sixth graders. And he spent like a month at Abington Heights School in their middle school testing all of the theories. So they created all of these scenarios of how they could teach the sport. They tested them all. They had, to, they had to note the success ratio. So eventually, here's what was happening. His advisor at Ohio State University was writing a book on the development of skills in sports before kids could do the sports. And Chris got volleyball and someone else got baseball and someone else got basketball. And the book would eventually be published by the director of the program. So Chris Davis knows everything there is to know about fifth and sixth graders trying to play volleyball. Solomon knows everything about everything. Everything about everything. Because he pursues it. And that's something we're going to see over the next several messages is how he pursues his understanding and knowledge of everything. 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 32. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. I get floored by that five. It is one thing to say, well, you know, he did a thousand of this and he did a couple thousand of this and just kind of round up the numbers. But when you say 1,005, somebody was counting them. This remark made in the scriptures is because somebody sat down and counted the Proverbs. Now, I haven't counted how many verses are in the book of Proverbs. And in the book of Proverbs, most of the verses themselves are a proverb of themselves. A single verse is a single proverb. It's kind of like a fortune cookie. You know, you open the fortune cookie and you hope to get that magic wisdom that leads you to greatness. I got one the other day that says I'm going to pursue some new opportunities. And, uh, you know, it's so vague. <laughs> the new opportunity could be, you know, I found a hat at Ollie's that was six bucks. So I bought it. That was the new opportunity, I suppose, that the fortune cookie meant. 3,000 Proverbs and 1,005 songs. He was going to share the wisdom that God gave him in a way that people could reflect on it, read it, criticize it, consider it, apply it. He made observations in short statements of practical truth. That's what it means to speak in Proverbs. Wise observations in short statements in a practical way that makes a difference in your life. Solomon sang his wisdom in songs. He made his wisdom memorable and repeatable. I don't know if you have noticed, if you've read the King James Bible, or even the New King James follows it pretty well, there's a great difference between reading the King James Bible and reading the New American Standard, or reading the NIV, or the Contemporary English Version. What you find in the King James Version is when the scholars decided to make a translation in the 1600s of the Bible into English for the common reader, they were working with a population that basically couldn't read. And they are writing the Bible in a form that the population could never read it. But how would the population hear the word of God? They'd hear it read to them. They'd hear it spoken. And one of the criteria given to the translators who are working on the King James Bible was you have to make it have rhythm. Translate it accurately, but it needs to have rhythm so people can memorize it because they're never going to read it. They're only going to be able to know it by memorizing it. 
Read the King James Bible versus the NIV, the New American Standard, the Contemporary English Version, the English Standard Version, or any of those other versions, you'll find the King James flows like a melody. Solomon wrote much of his wisdom in a way that people could just learn it and sing it and remember it and repeat it. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 33. Also, he spoke of trees. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. I mean, there was nothing outside of his interest. Now, remember, this is a man who has extreme wealth and has all the time on his hands. He's living in a period when God gave rest to the nation. There's no battles to fight. There's no conflicts to distract him. He doesn't have to worry about going to war in the spring. He doesn't have to worry about raising the money to fight the war, or raising up the soldiers to... To, to go to battle. He doesn't have to worry about any of that. He can devote himself to study, to understanding. There's an independent candidate for president right now, who, and I've listened to him a lot in a lot of interviews and stuff, this independent um, presidential candidate. And what is interesting is basically the last 30 years or so, he has devoted himself to understanding. He has explored all sorts of subjects. He is a man of, of insatiable desire to know and understand for the practical purpose of helping people. And when you listen to him, it's, it's kind of hard to listen to his voice. He has an interesting voice that just kind of makes it difficult. But when you listen to the words he says, you go, this is a guy who's had the privilege. Now, he's been part of a family that has had wealth, privilege, and he's had the opportunity to pursue understanding. You might not agree with his conclusions. You might not agree with some of his observations. But he's been a modern example of someone like Solomon who was able to devote his entire life to pursuing an understanding of the world. Solomon set his understanding to examine the created world of God. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 34. And the men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. The things he was discovering were things people wanted to know. If there was an internet, if there was social media, he would have been the one with the greatest number of followers. There's some guys out there, there's some groups out there that have 100 million or 500 million followers watching the stuff they do. There's one guy, he's called Mr. Beast. The guy makes millions every month on his YouTube channel and takes all that money and spends it on elaborate things and gives it away. Gives people cars. When he first started, he was giving people cars. He was walking up to people, strange people, and giving them a $30,000 car. And, and people wanted to watch him give money away and do outlandish things. Now, what Mr. Beast does, if you follow him, is nothing that benefits the world, except entertainment. There's no benefit to the world. Solomon is taking the wealth and the power that he has to benefit the world, and the world is coming to hear him. They're following him because he is saying things that nobody has said. What impact did his wisdom have on his world? 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1. Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. Solomon's wisdom showed God. The queen of Sheba comes in because it's the name of the Lord. Solomon is not saying, look how wise I am, look how smart I am. He's giving credit to God. God is giving me these words, and she wants to hear what God has to say. If I can give a question to Solomon that stumps him, then his claim that he's getting his messages from God falls short. It's kind of like the guy, the man or the woman, who declares they have a prophecy from God. Here's what Moses said about those prophets. If that prophet comes forward and they talk about another God, then you dismiss them. If they give you a prediction and it doesn't come true, then you dismiss them. So a prophet comes along, a prophetess comes along at the beginning of every year, and they begin to make predictions about what the world will experience in the coming 12 months. And if you watch those 12 months and those words come true, then you're thinking, this person has a connection to something. But if those words fall short, like they always do, or the words are so general that they're not specific that anything could be fulfilled, like a fortune cookie, then you'll know they're not speaking from God. So the Queen of Sheba comes to Solomon and says, are you really speaking for God? Because if you are, there should be no question you cannot answer. 
because God will want to give me the answer. So she comes with her hard questions. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 2, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. Was Solomon up to the task? Verse 3, so Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. No matter what she rose as a scenario, no matter what things she had been pondering, no matter what area of the world in his examination she had a question about, he had an answer. Does that mean he had the ability to talk about every nuance of scientific discovery we've had over the last 4,000 years? No. His purpose is to give wisdom, to give understanding to truth, not to define every small nuance. He wasn't going to be a thousand-person PhD. I have a degree. I remember, I remember someone telling me about a person they respected who was a double doctor, I mean, because he had two doctor's degree. And I met some guys who just, they just constantly go to school. They just collect degrees. And that is great if you're using that knowledge to benefit humanity. And if you're a Christian and you're pursuing higher education, make sure that higher education is actually helping people. When I was working on my doctorate at Baptist Bible Seminary, they asked me what I wanted to do as a doctoral thesis. You know, you're supposed to write some 200-page paper. Just have foot I hate footnotes. You like footnotes? You like writing papers? My mom typed my papers when I was in, in, element, in uh, high school. And then Vicki typed all my papers while I was in college. And then I got to the point where I don't want to write any more papers. So I went to my, the head of the doctoral program of Baptist Seminary, and I said, it was Mr. King. I said, Mr. King, I want to do a drama. Now, my doctorate is a doctor of ministries, and a doctor of ministries is designed that you become a better minister. It's a practical degree. It's not a PhD. It's not a doctor of theology where you study some nuance of how many angels can fit on the head of a pin, something like that. It's a practical degree. And I says, well, what I feel like, I was an associate pastor at Grace Baptist Church in Anchorage. What I thought was really going to be good was drama, was always going to communicate to people. I want to work on a drama. And here's what Dr. King said to me. He says, well, I don't know if we can get you as an advisor. We have to have an advisor who has a doctor's degree who could examine you in the area of drama so you could write a drama. Well, just happened to be at that time was a man by the name of Mr. Maxwell. He was working on his doctor's degree at New York University in drama. He was the drama speech teacher. And Dr. King went to him and says, would you supervise Tim Hamilton? He wants to do something dramatic as his doctoral thesis. And Mr. Maxwell says, yeah, I'm finishing my doctorate. I can be a supervisor. I went home from that class in October, went back to our church, met Connie Browning, who was our, who was our um, choir director and head of our music department, one of our pianists. And she was sitting down one day to me. And she says, Tim, we got to do something different for Easter. It was like January. It's got to do something different for Easter. I said, well, I've had this story running around in my head, this story that there's the centurion who's at the base of the cross who sees the crucifixion, but later meets the Apostle Paul and gets saved. And there's this whole story. So for about 15 minutes, I explain the story. She says, that's a great story. And then she starts rattling off five songs that the choir and solos could do that would fit exactly into that story. She says, why don't we do it for Easter? That was my doctoral thesis. I wrote the story in about two days. Connie put the music into it. We developed what it would look like. It's called The Day I Met the King. Solomon was able to give truth to people who would make a difference. Not just some theoretical thing, but things that would change people. What did the queen conclude from this? 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 6. Then she said to the king, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. I heard about you. I didn't really believe the report. Nobody could be that smart. Nobody could have that much wisdom. Nobody could have answers to every question. I heard about it, but when I got here, verse 7, however, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes, and indeed, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame of which I heard. No matter what I heard about you, you have exceeded it by 100%. 100%. The 
this is more impressive. How often have you ever gone anywhere where something was more impressive than what you thought it would be? That's happened to me only because I haven't done enough research to be impressed. But I'll tell you what. The first time I went to the Grand Canyon, and we were, we were kids, when I was teenagers, we go to the Grand Canyon, we go to the South Rim, you drive up to where the South Rim is, you park the car, and you walk to the canyon, and you walk to the canyon, and there is nothing as big. It is the largest canyon in the world, I believe. There is nothing as big as looking miles across this canyon that spreads everywhere, and you go, and every time I go to the Grand Canyon, because I don't go that often, I've only been there, I think, four times, it's the same overwhelming thing. Vicki and I took a trip with friends to, to Europe and to Italy, and we're on this little tour. And we're in this tour in Florence, and we all have headphones because we're in a group, and you want to make sure you can hear the tour guide. And he's speaking in English, and we're walking through these streets of Florence, and he's taking us places, and he's telling us all the things. And he tells us about this church. He says, there's a really famous church here in Florence, and it's, it's got a really unique architecture. So he's telling us about it, and we're just walking down the street and just listening, going, okay, this is real exciting. We turn this corner, and it's right there. We'd been walking beside the church the whole time, but until you got around the corner, you couldn't see it. And it's this most spectacular thing I had ever seen to that point, man-made by men. I don't know what the name of it is. Don't ask me. It's kind of like, it's like checkerboard. I don't know. I probably have a picture of it. All I know is the experience overwhelmed me. That's the experience the Queen of Sheba has with the Word of God. Should we not at some point in our lives be overwhelmed by the Word of God? Not like opening a fortune cookie, just flipping to some page and reading some random verse. You can do that. It is still the powerful word of God. You can flip to a random page. But if you would spend some time walking through portions of the word of God, I guarantee there will be things that will jump out at you. Here's one I shared in Sunday school this morning. So first, first Kings, Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 14, verse 9, if I remember it right, says, and Jesus was taken up from their view into heaven. Here's what struck me. Taken up, past, passive tense. Jesus didn't ascend himself. A force took him up. It's the Father. And here's what the angels say to the men. The way you saw him go up, he will come back. That means under the Father's direction, Jesus ascended under the Father's direction. Jesus will return. Jesus said earlier, I think it was in verse 7 of Acts chapter 1, he says, we don't know the time of when this will all come to pass, only the Father knows. And in that simple phrase, that simple passive tense, where Jesus is a passive participant in the Father's work, says unbelievable things about the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. There is an interrelationship between the Godhead that mirrors, not mirrors, that originates everything we experience. There is nothing that we experience that doesn't already exist in the eternal nature of God. That there is authority, that there is servanthood, there is submission, there is direction. All of that exists. And I saw it in one simple phrase, was taken up, passive tense. I didn't go and look at the Greek. I mean, I know guys, they would have found it in the Greek and say, oh, the Greek word is in the passive tense. You know, I just read it in the English because the English is also the passive tense. And I didn't see it till just this week. Never saw it before. Always thought the ascension was just kind of an add-on. You know, you have the crucifixion, which is really big, right? And we celebrate that on Good Friday. Then you have the resurrection, which is really big, and that's Easter. Notice how Easter is bigger than, than Good Friday. I don't know what that whole Wednesday thing is or that Monday, Thursday, Monday, Thursday. I don't know. I don't know what any of that is. But we make a big deal about Easter and we make a big deal about Good Friday. Do we even celebrate the Ascension? I mean, it's in some calendar. Probably there's a Catholic calendar or there's, a, or there's other denominations, maybe a Presbyterian calendar or somebody that has the Ascension as some big deal. But we don't. I mean, I'm 62 years old, and I never remember having an Ascension Sunday. Now, maybe a charismatic church has an Ascension Sunday. <laughs> Did you get that joke? It kind of flows. Colin got it. Good. An Ascension Sunday. But we don't. I was thought of as an add-on. And then today, as I'm sharing today, 
you know, I'm 62, and I'm sharing it today now after all these years. And, of course, I have a doctor's degree, so I should have discovered this a long time ago. And I studied Greek, and I studied Hebrew, so certainly I should have known that. And all of a sudden, God says, hey, Tim, wake up, passive tense, Jesus is subservient to the Father. I would think that the wisdom that God gave to Solomon, then shared in the scriptures, in addition to all of the other wisdom we find in the scriptures, should make a difference. The queen concluded Solomon's wisdom was real. 1 Kings 10, verse 9, last verse of the morning. Blessed be the Lord your God. She comes to hear the name of the Lord, and she gives a blessing to the Lord who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel because the Lord has loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you king to do justice and righteousness. Solomon is living in a day when the world is at peace. The worlds have made treaties with Israel. Israel has branched out into all of the known world at that point in relationship. And here is a representative of that world saying, You know what? You're the right person at the right time to do the right thing. This nation is truly loved. Is Israel the largest nation in the world at that point? Not in any stretch of the imagination. Are they the wealthiest? They got a lot of wealth, but not the wealthiest. But they are the shining example of what God can do with a person who says, God, use me. Use me in a profound way to change my world. Solomon's world was larger than all of our worlds. The influence you have is not as large as Solomon's, but is not any less significant as Solomon's. I was telling Vicki the other day, one of the, one of the neat things, now that I've, I'm, I've passed a year being in the schools as a substitute, one of the neat things is the opportunities to influence individual kids. I had a kid the other day, he's an eighth grader the other day, says, says uh, you know, Mr. Hamilton, you're my favorite substitute here in the school. I don't know how many subjects I've been with him. I was in a math class. I've done social studies. I've done science. I've done technology. Um, I haven't done English or any of those. But he says, and I says, well, why do you say that? He says, because you, you're old. That was the first thing he said. You're old, and you admit when you don't know something. I says, what do you mean? Well, like if we're having a math problem with something and you don't know it, you just say, hey, I don't know how to do that. I says, well, why wouldn't I say that? He says, oh, that is not what we get from every substitute. (laughs) And I I didn't want to probe anymore. Of course I'm going to say, now I was doing a problem where I had the answer key and I had the same class for three different periods. By the third period, I kind of figured out what was going on. It was functions, eighth grade functions. And I kind of got it. I was able to explain it to a couple kids who had missed the previous classes. I says, here's the solution. I don't know what this is all about. I said, I have no idea, but I think that something does something, and if you put an input here, this is the answer you have to get, and if you don't get that, it's not a function. So let's just go with that. I could only go with what knowledge I had. And this kid said, I appreciate the fact that you're honest. I think that's what he was saying, not saying that. Did you come in and you're just honest? Well, you know what? You can only fool kids so long. Pre-K, I got a handle on how to fool them. Addie comes up with some statement, and I got it handled. Veda, nah, it's a little more challenging with Veda. And when 10 of them tackle you in the playground, you're not sure how to handle that. I got to read the Proverbs to see if Solomon gives me a solution when 10 pre-K kids are surrounding you trying to knock you over. And one of them's kicking your shoe because they can get away with it because we're not seeing them kick your shoe. I think Solomon has something to say about how we handle children. And Solomon has something to say about what your life is about and what you will do. And hopefully we will see that over the coming weeks. Because the queen recognizes the love of God. The queen recognizes there is a righteous standard and that God has made a real difference in Solomon and in Israel and will in us as well. Dear Father, thank you, Lord, for the glimpse we get into the life that... uh, Solomon experienced because he surrendered himself to you. He asked for you to guide his steps, to lead his life, to give him understanding, to give him knowledge, to give him wisdom, to give him the ability to judge between right and wrong. And you honored him in that, and the world saw it. Help us to be those kind of people who are dependent on your word and your wisdom 
to make the life-changing decisions for ourselves that impact others as well. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let me invite you to stand with us. This song simply speaks about our willingness to surrender to God.
Don Miller, would you close in prayer, please? Before even time began, my life was in.